As a child, I grew up in a small southern Missouri town, just north of Ozark Mountain Range. There were about 10,000 people living there, and for the most part, they preferred to coop to themselves. It was a weird mentality you never ran into often in the South. During the summer followed my second year of elementary school. All of that would change. In this town, there was only one provider for television. It was an old cable provider known as Ozark Cable, which served southern Missouri and northern Arkansas. It only broadcasted 10 channels and given that satellite wasn't available within a hundred miles of my town, I had to make the best of it. In fact, the only children's programming available was Tom and Jerry Rublins, which broadcasted out of Little Rock on Saturday mornings. Needless to say, my options for my options for cartoons were particularly extraordinary. At the beginning of summer vacation following second grade, my family received a notice from Mozart Cable, as did the other 10,000 residents of town. The statement noted that a new high-tech broadcasting station was to complete construction just north of town. In addition, my town would now be receiving 30 new channels, including Nickelodeon. It was I was as excited as any child my age would be. Hell. I would finally be able to watch new cartoons any time during the week. During the third week of summer vacation, the broadcasting station went operational, and my small town finally entered the digital age. Static no longer interrupted regular programming, show lineups no longer switched without notice, and of course, I finally had Rocco's Modern Life. Overall, I was a pretty happy seven-year-old kid. That's when it started. I heard it first from one of my friends. Apparently his parents had been watching late night entertainment around midnight or one in the morning when sporadic interferences in the broadcast began to occur. Images of an eyeless man flashed on the screen for seconds of time, accompanied by startlingly loud white noise. Apparently, it was loud enough to wake up my friend. Unsettled, his parents contacted the cable provider and notified them about the incident, and were subsequently told that it would be looked into. However, the problem persisted. Eventually, it became so frequent and widespread throughout the town that my Parents actually prohibited me from watching any television between midnight and dawn. Not that I was interested in doing so anyways. Soon, no one watched any late night television. There were movers of televisions sporadically turning on and displaying the eyeless man, seeming to reach out towards the viewers. They were just rumors. One Thursday morning while my dad was at work, my mom needed to run to the town and pick up her prescription from the local pharmacy. Normally, I was forced to accompany her on daily expeditions into town, but after begging to stay home and watch a new episode of Ren and Snippy, she surrendered and left to run her errand. After sneaking a few cookies, I sat in front of the TV and waited for the episode to begin. The episode began as usual, with its can't, catchy theme song and glimpses into the ant mix of the characters then the picture went black you can only imagine how enraged I was I've been waiting all week for this new episode only to have the channel go out after parading around the TV room only in a fit of child fr childhood frustration I sat in front of the television and waited for the broadcast to resume a brief spark of static appeared on the screen, and I sat in eager anticipation for the episode to resume. Images of decomposing and disemboweled bodies filled the screen, accompanied by ear-piercing screams that filled the house. Immediately, 
I immediately ran out of TV room, but not before looking back at the television. A man with bloodied holes for eyes seemed to approach the screen with his livid, decaying arm reaching out. I hid under the dining room table and began to sob hysterically. In my fit of nauseated terror, I vomited on the floor. When my mother came home, she seemed to jump back at the noise that consumed the house, and immediately dropped her bags and pulled me out from under the table. I was hysterical and my face was pale with fear. Before I could answer my mother about what was going on, she entered the TV room. The screaming stopped. She unhooked the television. When I finally told her what happened, she heard a knock at the door. It was my friend and his parents. He was sobbing and was hiding his face against his mother's shirt. They experienced the same thing I had. Everyone in town did. Almost immediately, law enforcement, local law enforcement began ev involved during, due to the nature of the images. After a week of no television sleeping with my parents in my parents' bed, the local police department issued a statement. It wasn't as conclusive as we had wished. About five months before the original notice in regards to the new broadcasting center, Ozark Cable brought a piece of land that belonged to a long abandoned sanitarium and one site burial ground. In addition to demolishing the desecrate building, over 200 bodies were exhumed and cremated without warrant to make room for miles of underground cables. Ozark Cable was immediately fined and its owner was prosecuted. After three months of legal battles, the cable company eventually shut down, with satellite television making its place soon after. The source of the images remains unknown. It is also known how the broadcast even happened in the first place.